So this meeting is now being recorded. Everything will be posted to the Town of Amherst YouTube channel. And thank you, everyone. Thank you. Um, hello, I'm Christine Gray Mullen, and this is the Jones Library Design Subcommittee meeting. Um, it's uh, Friday, April 29th and 9 a.m. So we have an agenda and I'll call this meeting to order. We have um, myself and uh, two of the other members, George and Sharon, Austin will not be with us today. And we have uh, Craig, our OPM, and we have uh, two, Ellen and Josephine from Fine Gold, uh, Alexander. So we'll get going here. First, I have uh, item number two, minutes uh, from April 15th. I hope everyone uh, could look at them, uh, George and Sharon, so uh, do I hear a motion to move on approving the minutes? Uh, motion to approve. And a second? S second. Thank you. Okay, were there any uh, comments or changes that either of you want to make? No. Okay, all right, so we'll take a vote. Um, and there's just three of us, so uh, yes to approve. George? Yes. Sharon? Yes. Myself, yes. So Angela, unanimous three, right? We'll move on to item three, we have Collier's project leader. We have Craig here um, and I'll, uh, we have two items, uh, the timeline and the construction costs. So I'll turn it over to Craig. All right, thank you, Christine. Um, I'll, I'll share my screen. I've got a schedule up that'll aid in the discussion. So I'll take those two items in order, if that's okay. Right. So schedule, so you guys should be able to see, oh, no. Now you should be able to see that. We see it. Awesome. So this is the same schedule that we, that I presented at the library building committee meeting earlier this week. Um, we are at the tail end of April right here. I'm sorry. Yeah, so tail end of April right here. So I, I meant to add a red line in to help for future meetings, I'll do that so we can see exactly where we are. But we're just at the beginning of the SD phase. Um, so Feingold Alexander proposed that they start, so they, they've got eight weeks of sort of intensive design work. And they propose that they're gonna begin that on May 9th. Um, so if that's the date that we start, um, that'll bring that phase of intensive work will go May 9th through July 1st. And during that time, we'll have four design subcommittee meetings, assuming that we go with, we continue with that two times a month. I think it's second and fourth Friday of each month. So it is the typical, something like that. That's um, yeah. Yeah, so what, whatever the case may be, we'll, we'll have four design committee design subcommittee meetings in that in that time. So that would be my recommendation that we give Feingold Alexander the okay to proceed with schematic design on um, May, um, May 9th. And I don't know that we need a vote or anything, but um, Ellen, what, what, what would you guys feel comfortable with to sort of know that you've got the official go ahead? Yeah, I, I don't, we don't need you to take a vote, but one thing we do need, um before then, so we can start. We need the programming, including the book counts. And I know um, Sharon's working on that for us. So that so that's terrific. Um, the client changes we went over uh, with MBLC the other day, that was really productive. Um, so we can get on that. In the confirmation of sustainability goals, we just, we think it's worth the group um, looking at what we have and just confirming that we're going in that direction. Because once we start with some of these goals, uh, there's no turning back. Some of them are simple that we do every day, but some we're talking here about a different structural system um, and that kind of thing really has an impact on the design. Okay. Is there a list specifically of those climate issues that sustainability um yeah. Josephine do we have some kind of I'm not sure Christine if it's a proper list but we have a narrative at least of what we're doing right it's not oh. exactly a, in a you know a specific um document but we do have um from some of the presentations from um a year or two back 
um, we have a breakdown of what those were that we could probably um, use as a reference. So you're asking the design subcommittee to um, approve the narrative that you have on the sustainability building issues. And then, I mean, so what are you looking for? Do you want a vote approving from the full committee? I, th I think what it, it, typical on a lot of these projects, Christine, there's, there's really big goals for sustainability as there should be. And um, what, you know, through our previous work with, with the committees, we, we got to uh, a number of sustainability goals that at that point folks wanted. We just are asking, maybe not, it's, maybe it's just not the design group, Christine, maybe it's your bigger group, is to read that and just let us know, yes, we want to do all these things and then we'll include that in it. It's just because it's been a while, um, and there, there, you may actually have some new, new people involved. And I think it would be best for everybody if, if that was just um, tied up in a, in a neat uh, bow, just so we all know what we're doing. Okay, so what I'm hearing is um, this, I should pass this on to Austin, the chair of the larger group. And this uh, should be. I, I, that's what I think, but you guys would know better, Craig. I, I'm not sure, you know, I don't. I really am not, I shouldn't tell you what, how to do it, but we're just looking for direction from you. We can provide you with the information you need. Um, and then we can get feedback from you. That would be terrific. So we, um, we sorry to interrupt you, Craig, but uh, so we would have it in our trustee meeting minutes and I can certainly have that available for the next oh, cool. larger Jones Library building committee meeting so we could have a vote then. Um, but my, I guess my, even before we, we could uh, approve that, my only concern is what that means for the budget. And, um, right. you know, we had talked about that's one way to save money. So on the one hand, I want to tell you, yes, move forward. But then how difficult is it later on to scratch something? Well, it, it's difficult to not yeah. everything, right? Because some things are easy, but it's yeah. when we're talking about structural system, that's a little harder to do. Um, and I, I believe, Sharon, we, and just correct me if I'm wrong, we had some budget numbers for you pre-COVID, yeah. right, of what those yeah. numbers were. And we know since COVID, numbers have gone up. Um, but we can share that with you if you if you don't, if you can't find it. We do have some rough numbers. Yeah, no, we we have it. And so so yeah. I'm specifically talking about the CLT, for example. You know, yes. I know that by cutting that out, that would save us, what was it, three hundred and sixty thousand dollars, something like that. Right. Um, but so does that mean you need to hear from us now that yes. we want to cut that out? Boy, that is. Yeah. The. So this could become very like if if we're trying to get an approved you know, recommendation or an, a, like a thumbs up from the committee at large. Uh, I, I think we need almost like a bullet list of what we're saying. Yes, we're moving, we want them to include in the schematic design. Um, yeah, I can get that for you. I have that. Okay. Great. And just bring it to that committee, that large committee, it could be require a lot of explaining um, if it's the first time this is happening. So maybe we do need to discuss it here um, in the design and we hear all the details and it gets vetted out a little and then we vote a recommendation for the committee at large to support it. Does you follow what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. I do. I'm not even sure that it's, I, I think the discussion is more about the budget than it is about a design issue. So I, I don't know what we in this subcommittee really have to talk about because, uh, well, and maybe this is just me, but yes, we want CLT. Yes, we want the solar panels. Yes, we want all of those ECMs that the trustees approved. That hasn't changed but the larger committee would be talking about the budget. And so things could change there. Right, but then it's a lot. So what I'm saying is I know you really know all this, but I like don't. And then mm -hmm. again, the public, and right now we're trying to solicit 
opinions from the public and for ones that are following this closely, you know, these meetings generate newspaper articles and such and that it educates them. So it puts a lot on the committee if you're taking apart all the sustainability issues and explaining them and then trying to vet out, can we afford them and do we need them? Um, I mean, no, I totally get it. it I'm, I'm, I'm only thinking about the timing. So if, if this committee is gonna talk about it, you're gonna have to wait two weeks. And, and, then, and then after that discussion, it, then it would go back to the, the full JLBC. So then it wouldn't get back to Ellen timing is not our friend right now. Um, so I'll push it back to Ellen. It, looking at Craig's calendar here, if it was a month from now, that's the end of May, is that too late for these in your design? And that makes me nervous. Yes. What else is very time sensitive that no, you I, now? Those are the most time sens sensitive ones. And that was, we, that was in our proposal we did we don't we're, it, it, it and i don't want us to sound like we're being pests because we're not we're trying to save you guys aggravation later right because if if we go down the road and you know we're really over budget and we can't afford some of those things we have to go back and change it all and that's time and money and we're mm -hmm. trying to avoid that because we we have an aggressive um <clears throat> eight week period which is all well and good we can do all our work within that time but we don't want to set you up and us up for an issue at the end of this phase yeah i just feel like we'll have to have this entire discussion at the next building committee meeting when is that meeting this my the my agenda says may 10th okay yeah. would it be helpful if one of us was at that meeting probably I think that has to be, yeah. Okay, that's fine. Um, it's at 4.30. That's fine. And what we, Josephine, what we should do is circle back with our structural engineer and just to see when it's critical for her to know that. I'm assuming it's the beginning of the phase, but she may have a little wiggle room. Yeah, we can do that. Yeah. Okay. Why don't we do that? We'll we'll go through Craig and let you know um, what she says. But if you send us an invitation to that meeting, um, yep. we can attend. One or two or three of us will attend, and it's virtual. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yes. We'll do that. So Sharon, if you can get that list out of those uh, library trustee minutes. Yeah. And you know, sort of, and then uh, can you send that to Austin and explain? For yeah. him to put it on his agenda. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Craig, I have a question about the schedule. Yes. So if if the eight week schematic design was starting on um, May 9th, and I'm looking at the schedule and you roll out eight weeks, right? Mm -hmm. So you have this taper down, you know, triangle. Um and actually the rectangle itself is passed probably what is July 9th. What does that mean? Like, so when it's eight weeks, is it a hard eight weeks? Sure, so uh, so the down on the left side of the um, schedule are the different things we're tracking. So the design phase that we're talking about is this blue bar. So SD stands for schematic design. So it's that, that blue bar there. This larger area with these with the taper and, and, the, and the rectangle, sort of this golden color, is the public commentary. So this was something that the building committee asked us to show graphically um, the period of greatest impact of public commentary on the project, which is during schematic design, and then the period of impact on certain aspects of the project, specifically, you know, color selections, interior materials decisions that are made later in the process, kind of going into design development, but then that, as that taper indicates, the, the longer, the deeper into that phase we go, the less a particular comment, the less impact a particular comment might have. Mm -hmm. So we sort of got this like window of say approximately six months where that public commentary can really be rolled in and have a, a big impact on the design. 
but then sort of beyond that, now we're into the into the point where if someone comes up with a great idea and, and the library building committee says, yes, we want to pursue this, it will involve sort of taking some steps back. Um, and then of course, naturally there'd be a, a time consequence, uh, a cost consequence. Um, so those will be things that would have to be factored in. Again, if someone comes up with a fantastic idea and everyone gets right. behind it and says, we got to do this, it can be done. It just will have, at that point, we'll analyze what's the time implication, what are the cost implications, mm -hmm. and then the building committee can make a, an informed decision. Right. But what Ellen was bringing up is that that's um, some of these design sustainability issues, or I assume some other design issues, really have to be decided pretty much now or in the next couple of weeks, or it's costly. Yes, and so um, talking about the schedule, talking about the budget and talking about these design kind of let's say parameters they're all interconnected and so yes there are certain aspects sustainability is something the town has indicated is very important to them mm -hmm. um there are certain decisions that we're gonna that the building committee is gonna have to make um having that list of kind of these are the things that are up for discussion and then having kind of an understanding of the magnitude of cost will be important for them to see kind of all in one place and then have a, a robust discussion about which ones are musts, must haves. And those must haves are ones that uh, Fine Gold Alexander will carry on with. Um, given the, the cost as the recent cost estimate and the, the awareness that we're, uh, the, the construction cost is over budget, um, that will have to be in sort of the forefront of everyone's mind. So when we're reviewing the different options, um, that's something that everyone will have to consider. So, um, you know, the goal, the, the process is, the design process is iterative. That means, you know, there's, we always have sort of have, you know, evaluating things or Feingold Alexander and the building committee are evaluating things, kind of working forwards, backwards, you know, kind of, towards uh, the ultimate design, but there are some decisions, as Ellen was indicating, that do need to be made kind of upfront. Uh, yeah, so can I- Some of things are th decisions that would be, need to be made upfront. Can I interrupt for a minute? So Jim Alexander is one of the attendees and he has his hand raised. Uh, Christine, would it be okay for me to invite him to speak? Oh, sure. I was like, I don't see his hand. I don't see him. Sure. Yes. Um, oh, Angie took care of it. <laughs> there. Can you hear me? Yeah, you can. I'm sorry. I just had a quick question. I wondered if um, did the budget get updated, Ellen, in the in the last few yes. weeks? It did. So we're we're so everything is being looked at with that in mind. So yep. okay. I, yes. I yes. And sure. the thing that I was and I was didn't want to interrupt it, um, Craig is what I think we need to do, Craig, is the exercise that we had Seamus do when we were evaluating the sustainability goals pre-COVID. We should have him look at those numbers again because those numbers thinking, yeah. are going to be higher. Yeah. So if you don't, the, meaning if we change our, what we're going to do on some things, the savings may be greater than we're, we're thinking. Mm -hmm. So we can, um, we can send you what we have on that, Craig. And I, I'm sure we could get Seamus to turn it around pretty quick because it's not a big uh, exercise for him. That's great. That's what I was thinking too. So yeah. Great. yeah. I agree that that'll be important information for the, the building committee to have in order to make informed decisions. Yes. Thank you. Um, so if there are any other things like this that can be brought to the design committee as soon as possible, these sort of like, oh, if we don't decide things now, it's going to, you know, cause problems later, um, please bring them up or, you know, have me put them on the agenda, you know, Craig, if you see things, because, you know, already this is the first meeting and we're like, sort of skipping here and sending it right to the committee and scrambling, which this is what happens. It's like we wait, 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 and then the start gun goes and we're all like running. Right. Um, 
Yeah. And one thing, Christina, Josephine, we had three items we program we got covered because um, Sharon is working on that as we speak. Um, the suspend the sustainability. Was there a third? To cover for this morning, you mean? Yeah. For the agenda items. From the um, things that we felt as though we want to bring to the committee and. I think get, those. Yeah, those were pretty much it. We were, wanted to, you know, make sure we're starting off with the correct set of plans. Um, and of course that includes sustainability goals and then, yeah, just the programming okay. um, and book Great. grants, et cetera. It's only, so it's only those two items. That is good. Um, George um, and Sharon, do you have any questions on this um, schedule? No, not for me. George. Okay. So yeah, Craig, if it would be helpful to have like a current line, like where we are, and maybe also put where that eight week actually ends. Um, you know, I know it's the SD phase there. Um, but as people look at this, I think we all have to really keep in our head that that's when this phase is, is to be done. You got it. Okay, you have costs. Construction costs, good news. <laughs> so I'll start by showing the, the, the current um, total construction cost um, in our budget. So that's this figure, and this is in thousands. So it's escalated construction costs, 26, say, 0.9 million dollars. So that's what we figured in to uh, Amherst's overall budget, which works. Uh, with the, I think it's uh, 36 point, let's say $3 million total project budget. So what we received recently was the update to the cost estimate. Uh, this was discussed at the building committee, but I'll go through it again quickly here. So this is kind of the, the bottom, the, the meat of it here, $30.3 million construction cost estimate. So that's 30.3 30 in comparison to the 26.9 that we've got budgeted. So project as of this moment um, is over budget by 3.4 million or about 13%. Now at the building committee, I, I emphasize how this is really preliminary. So this cost estimate includes a ton of assumptions. Mm -hmm. um, include both about the design of the project, what's in the project, what's not in the project, as well as what's gonna happen with the, the, the market between now and when you know project goes out to bid. So while this is a good indicator, I don't think we necessarily need to hit the panic button. Um, and I don't wanna speak for Fine Gold Alexander, but um, I think the idea of the design process or one of the main goals of the design process and that iterative uh, you know, design, take a look at another cost estimate, see where we are, change things if needed, to do, develop the design further, another cost estimate, look where we are, change things if needed. So the, the purpose, the function of that process is to deliver a design to you got to the town that meets the budget. Um, and maybe Ellen, I'll, I'll turn things over to you. I know we had a, had a quick mm -hmm. discussion about this uh, the other day with Sharon yeah. and some of the ideas and, and thoughts you had shared um, were, I think, helpful. Right, so, right, and we, we, we agree with Craig not to hit the panic button because the what was estimated was very conceptual, right? It was architectural plans, uh, elevations, and written narratives of the different systems. So it wasn't a lot of engineering that was done. So at, the, at that point, this this um, estimator who we use quite often, a, a fantasy consultant, has to make, as Craig said, a bunch of assumptions. So so that's what we we suggest that we keep we move on with this in mind that we have this gap at the moment in in design with the thought of not thought with the mission of bringing down the cost. Right. So being clear to the engineers, we're trying to save money here. Give us some options for a streamlined system for mechanical, structural. Uh, we'll look at the finishes and the cladding. 
and we can have a series of options built into the drawings so they can be priced. You know, different cladding materials, they may look similar, but the, you know, one may be a, a better price point than another in the same on the interiors. And that's when we start making choices. Correct. Like, like when you're shopping in a store, you're like, yeah. there's this, this, and this, what can I afford and what will work? Right. So this is sort of um, twofold. This is just because the public doesn't know, this is like a subcontractor that you hire and mm -hmm. this is what they do. They do estimates. Yes. And there was an estimate at the beginning that was very conservative and had a lot of markups and made right. for this kind of, in, you know, because inflation and things happen. Right. So this number, this uh, fantasy, like this starts getting tighter and tighter as we start making design design decisions. Correct. Okay. And one thing I did want to make note of is that the numbers that we had originally that we were designing to were pre-COVID. And the most people, maybe not most people, if you're not in the construction business, you may not realize it, but the cost of construction materials has skyrocketed. And it, it partly, uh, it's supply and demand is part of it. And it's just shortage of labor. Um, where that's going to go, nobody knows, right? So it's good that we're starting this process because it could be even worse in five years. But, we, but we're mindful and we can set it up that we do, you know, working with Josephine, we'll have a series of different alternates for different finishes and and, and try to get to the, to the number. We do know after our meeting with MBLC, we cannot reduce the size of the building. That's just not gonna happen. In their mind, and we did, we've already reduced it. So they've been flexible with us to this point and they made it very clear, there's no wiggle room. Excellent to know, thank you. Um, Craig, do you have anything else or I'll open it to questions to George or Sharon? Nothing else. Any questions? I, Sharon, I see your hand. Yeah, I just wanted Craig uh, for the audience. So can you, can, can you explain at the building committee meeting, we were talking about a $6 million overage and now you're saying it's only 3.4, only 3.4 million. Can you explain why those numbers have changed? Certainly. So there are two different numbers. So um, what we what the project had done um, prior to say the pause uh, the, is back in 2020, um, Fantasy Consulting Services did a construction uh, a cost estimate um, based on the drawings that were available at the time and came up with a you know a total project cost of 24.8 million. Um, so this is a document from 2020. So once the project started up again, just recently, everyone recognizes that, you know, market, the market has changed. Uh, cost estimate from two years ago is not super helpful. We needed an update. So without any new information, um, just responding to how things have changed in the market, um, Fennessy provided this document, which shows, um, Re reflects what's happened in the market over the last two years and a uh, total construction cost of 30.3 million. And so that delta between 24.8 and 30.3, 2020 to 2022, was that five and a half or $6 million we're talking about. So that's just the construction cost estimate. The, um, that's how much we think the buildings have cost, but we have a budget. And so that budget, uh, wasn't for that, did not perfectly align with that, does not perfectly align with that old cost estimate. It actually has some extra capacity in it. And so the current budget is 26.9 million. So the delta between our current budget and our current cost estimate is that 3.4 million. Mm. So when we talk about that's five and a half to 6 million, that the difference between 2020 and 2022, how much we think the bill is going to cost, but the 3.4 million is how much we have budgeted now versus how much we think it's going to cost now. Does that answer the question? Perfect. Thank you. Yeah, that was great. A lot of numbers, but great. 
<laughs> Sorry. No, no, it's good. And just again, for the public, like it would have normally like we're talking, oh, we had COVID and, you know, these supply chains and inflation, you know, so but this this discussion would have happened anyways, because as time goes by, mm -hmm. it, it, everything keeps increasing. So it's not like it would have stayed the same. All right. So um, if we move on to item, thank you, Craig, uh, item for uh, Ellen, a uh, design status. Well, I give you, it can give you a quick update. We had a really great meeting with MBLC staff. Um, I forget what day it was. It was earlier this week with Sharon and Craig and Josephine and I. Um, they're really excited that we're moving forward, which is great. Um, so we, we, we reviewed the plans. We reviewed um, some of Sharon's uh, staff comments. Um, so I think we're in a really good place to really get going. Um, uh, they gave us some of their comments of one thing that we should keep in mind. They're very concerned about sight lines in the library, right? This is this is the the way that libraries are going this way for safety, right? So that's on that's top on our priority. How do we get the sight lines? But we also have a little bit of a challenge because we have the historic structures report. So we have to really play a balance there. So that will be part of our, um, you know, one of our de design challenges in this is getting at the sight lines that we all know we need, but also working within the working with the historic structures report. But but I think we're in a good place with just those couple of things, Christine. I, we're we're raring to go. All right. So uh, for design status, so May 9th is when you're like yep. officially starting. And you've told us everything that you need, either from the library or the trustees or the committee. Yes. Yep. Okay. And that should be coming. It's great. Does anyone have any questions for um, any of the design team? I don't see any hands up. Okay. Um, thank you. So item uh, five, uh, this is uh, the outreach subcommittee. They're having their uh, open house on Sunday. It's from noon to two, again, May 1st on Sunday. Um, I plan on being there to help. I don't know, um, or any, Sharon, I assume you're gonna be there. Um, so it sounds like it's gonna be a great event. I don't know, Sharon, do you wanna say anything about it? Sure. Yeah. So it's definitely it, it, it's turned it's very much a community driven event. Um, folks are being invited to come. There are 16, 17 different tables set up throughout the library uh, and each table has a different focus, whether it's historic preservation or seniors or, uh, you know, adult collections, that kind of thing. You, you wander the building. There are sticky notes and magic markers everywhere. And you're just going to write down your thoughts, uh, comments, concerns, hopes, dreams and all of that. There's a couple of Q&A tables. So if you have questions, uh, you can come to those tables and we'll try and answer them. Uh, there's also, there will be children's activities outside under the tent. It looks like the day is going to be absolutely beautiful. Um, there's also a scavenger hunt in the building at, going between the different uh, tables so that kids can participate inside as well. Uh, we have a, a, a big contingent of teens that will be coming, you know, to give their thoughts. Um, so just come out and have fun. That's what we're looking for. Thank you. It sounds great. And it looks really well planned. I've been following all the documents. So it's from noon to two, but it's really a drop in drop out thing. So it's not like people come and there's a presentation and there's like that you just come in anytime and leave thoughts. Help us do this. Come and visit one or two tables, visit all the tables or, you know, whatever you want to do. Yeah. We're not going to lecture you about anything. Okay. That's what I was wondering. People might want to just come because we have to suck them in from outside in Lagoria. A beautiful day, you know, so they can dip in, dip out. Sounds excellent. Um, so uh, I'll move on to item six, which is topics not anticipated by the chair. Um, I do want to bring up something that came up because we had a full committee meeting on Tuesday and we um, 
you know, we're trying to figure out systematically how we're going to work all this. So right now, like we have this outreach event where we're collecting feedback and ideas to, um, you know, try to see how we can make them work. Um, but then we have our own committee. And right now we only have Sharon and George and I that are on this, but there's other, other uh, Jones Building um, committee members who want to bring up ideas or feedback or, and um, one of them that came up was the non-gender, you know, bathrooms or whatever. So how should we flow ideas? And this is also for the outlook, what we collect from Sunday, how does Fine Gold Alexander want us to feed through Craig, I assume, to handle this in the most efficient and systematic way, rather than jumping from thing to thing. Actually, Christine, we, we just started this on another project where the client has a million changes and it was hard for us to keep track, not suggesting you guys are gonna have one, but if we have, if we, I'm not sure who would do it, is compile a list, maybe in a, a Excel spreadsheet, um, of, of the comments and the items. So then we can track them, right? And then we can sit as a group and say, you know, and maybe every couple of, maybe we take 20 minutes to half an hour at each of our meetings just to run through some of the comments and then get reaction. Is this something we should continue to look at? Or is this something, oh, it's really not going to fit with our program or it's not allowed by MBLC. But I, I would suggest we do that because there should be a running list. Craig? Yes, uh, I agree with Ellen 100%. Um, and I think the, I haven't read the charter of the, the building committee or the subcommittees, but um, the way I kind of see it happening is outreach collects up the information, roughly categorizes it, um, and that's kind of an ongoing process. That gets handed over to the design subcommittee. Design subcommittee takes a look at it with, um, solicits advice from Feingold Alexander, my office, and we sort of chew it over. Then the items that are recommended or not recommended to go forward, you guys hand those up to the building committee. The building committee makes the ultimate decision. Um, so that would be my recommendation, kind of that, that process, that three-step process. And there's a spreadsheet or something or a list that so we'll get some in big clumps, but what mm -hmm. about like an individual one, like say what happened at the building committee? My recommendation would be to use, I mean, we have to work on the details, but to use some kind of web-based document yeah. that we can, you know, with, uh, you know, track changes on that we can yeah. see all the comments. And then it's kind of like a, a living document, um, but it it have to be managed. Um, wh whoever from say the if outreach is responsible for compiling the information, they would have we'd have to develop a system with them where things are either dated or somehow um, tracked so that things don't just appear, but rather we see okay here's the new items. All right, let's absorb those into the conversation. Right, so and more I, trickled in. Let's take a look at those. Right, and I think one of the the key pieces is make sure they're dated. So the way we're setting this other one up is that. We have the item and make sure they're all numbered. Um, and then when we receive the comment and then a section for notes. So that way we can track when things are coming in and we, we can see, oh, this question has been asked, you know, on a number of different dates. So it's something that would be helpful for us. Right, similar, because that's true. I, I mean, one person can ask, but when you see something trending where many, many people are asking, then that should take a little bit more priority. I would oh, think. yeah, definitely. And then possibly that document could even serve a, a function as like a main document or primary document where we can also track how it was dealt with. All right, discussed at uh, design subcommittee, discussed at building committee, incorporated into the project or discussed, discussed, not incorporated, um, just as a way to then kind of close that loop. So there's lots of topics, design issues that are gonna come up and cause a lot of discussion probably in the building committee. Um, like, you know, it was like the, the gender issues of bathrooms was one, but it could be the sustainability issues. It, it 
it could be a cafe. I, you know, I don't know. So if, and I hate to see, and I know Austin doesn't want this either when we're starting to get in the weeds and that, I mean, that's the whole reason why this design subcommittee right. sort of exists. So is there a way, Craig, that we can sort of give some instruction and guidance to the whole building committee about this at the next meeting? How, because I get it, like I'm here, Sharon's here, George, you know, we have an easier way to voice our little passions and wants and, you know, and they want their voice here too. So how do we make them feel better that their issues are going to get addressed? So similar to the process I just described for um, bringing public feedback in and processing it, I think there'll be a similar process for um, things being discussed here in this subcommittee and the various other subcommittees. Um, chewing over them, talking about the code implications, talking about the costs, the facts, the figures, and having a discussion about it, distilling that down to a recommendation, and then offering that up sort of executive summary style to the building committee to make an ultimate decision. And some things they'll, I'm sure, go with the recommendation of this subcommittee or other subcommittees, but then other things they may want to consider more or send back to you guys or um, overturn or uh, go in a different direction. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> also in parallel with that, so that's kind of feeding information up the chain. And then in parallel to that, um, items that they identify as being important and they say, this is something that should be discussed, you know, researched, discussed at the design committee level, uh, subcommittee level, they'll send those down. And same thing, you know, we can, as a group can do the legwork, um, do all the uh, data collection, formulating, a, formulating an opinion, and then offering that back up to uh, the building committee. Okay, so, and I'm just harping on this one because I know it's gonna happen almost every meeting. So at the last building committee meeting, the, you know, the whole, how many gender bathrooms to have. So as Ellen brought up earlier, you know, some of these things really change the design and, I know from designing, you know, how many bathrooms and where they're going and how big or small they are is a really big thing. So I understand where there's, you know, there starts to be this panic of like, you don't want to miss the opportunity to get the max and, you know, things like, ugh, you know, is there a, a plumbing variance needed or whatever, all that will take time. So for something like this, what can I go back to that meeting on the 10th and say, oh, we're gonna discuss that. Is that in a month, two months? I, I think the, the, the quicker and more nimble we are, the better. Mm -hmm. um, so loud, you know, using the, um, so the gender inclusivity as a um, kind of an example. So that's something that we heard loud and clear at the building committee. So right away, I'll feed that information over to the design team and say, hey, this is what this has come up. This is a really important issue. Can you look into it a little bit? Pull together some information that you can then present at the next design subcommittee. Um, and you did just that. <laughs> yes, exactly. And then we can, we can talk about it. We can talk about sort of like the code implications, uh, uh, how many bathrooms there currently are, what, you know, in general, we're seeing kind of in other, you know, projects analyze it, discuss it, and then same thing, sort of report back to the, the, the building committee and say, this is what we talked about, this is what we recommend, or if there's a, if it's a, something that's bigger, we recognize this is bigger than just the design subcommittee, say, all right, we're not making a recommendation, but this is what we've looked into, this is what we found, building committee, you know, please consider. So, um, so when would this come to the design subcommittee to have a discussion about. So if Michael Alexander um, does have some preliminary, I, I just gave him the uh, the heads up maybe a day or two ago, but if they do have some preliminary um, thoughts on this particular topic, I think now would be a perfect time. Ellen? Right. Yeah, and my question, the interesting thing, Josephine's working on a project at Boston University and they're dealing with this right now. So she has some good background. My question to the group, and maybe Josephine, you can chime in on what's happening at BU, is is it all the bathrooms or do will some people in town not feel comfortable with that and want, you know, a, a, a woman's in a men's room? And do you want 
one of those or two of those? That's that's my question. And just mean I don't know what your your experience was at BU with that. As is that at everything? Yeah, and just to add to that, Ellen, um, some of it is desire, of course, as I think Craig had mentioned. That some of it is code implication, of course, mm -hmm. and that we're reaching all of the numbers, um, and of course square footage, um, depending on how you want that layout. Um, so it is going to be a work in progress as we move forward. Um, at the moment, yes, I'm working on a project where we have a couple of gender, um, you know, gender neutral bathrooms, and then we had um, a gang of male and female bathrooms. And what we did was pretty much we're getting um, all the fixtures um, to be the same in both bathrooms um, at the moment. How they move forward with that. So we'll there's no them. urinals. There are. Okay, sorry. There are, yeah. Okay. But uh, any other fixtures will be the same um, within fixtures, um, equipment, appliances, everything will be the mm -hmm. same in both bathrooms. So um, it, it will vary on a couple of different matters, but some of that will be on um, what you folks are looking for as well. Back and to just, what Ellen was, was noting. Right. And Josephine, we do, one of our questions is the implications of the plumbing counts, how yep. that affects them. So we're going to go back to our plumbing engineer and ask that. But this is new for a lot of folks. But so it's, a, it's as Josephine's saying, it's evolving. And it's just what the appetite for Amherst is. I was just in New York City at a hotel using the lobby bathroom, and it was gender neutral, which is fine. But I don't think everybody... As long as people are comfortable, we're, we can design that for you. You know, and can I ask that that was actually my question. So um, I think I could be wrong, but I think the initial uh, desire is for all the bathrooms to be gender okay. neutral. So, but my question to I thought I heard at the building committee that that couldn't happen because of code. Could it happen? I think it could. Okay. That's, okay. That's exactly we just, what we need to loop yeah. into and okay. get um, a confirmation with our consultant as we move forward. So this will be a part of the the, the bigger building committee discussion. If yeah. if they want all of them, I, I think that's the desire. Right. So just the reason that this is a question is that when we're designing, there's more fixtures. So there's more toilets and sinks in a woman's room than there is men's room. So now we have to figure out how do we split it? Do we do 50-50? So it's just, it's, it's just that kind of level of detail that we need to get, which we can get to. It's just, it's little research. Got it. Thank you. So can you present a couple of options? Because we're still unclear, oh, sure. um, you know, all of them or most of them or, you know, more, because like you said, it's been a process. So the slow yeah. process has been those like family bathrooms are becoming more and more, mm -hmm. but you mm -hmm. can't have like 16 of those, you know, no. so there's okay. these new designs that are evolving. Um, but I understand that. So like building code requires, you know, the square footage and how many anticipated people, and then they come up with a number of how many fixtures or you mean toilets yes. that have to be like on that floor. So then where you're changing this around, you have to go to the plumbing board and ask for like a variance. And have they been, have there we, been many of these all exclusive, I mean, all gender neutral bathrooms? I don't, I, I, that I don't know. I, the, I don't, I'm not sure, Christine, we would need a variance. That's what we have to sort out. Um, mm -hmm. And what we will do, we'll also do it, we'll check with MBLC what they're seeing in the libraries now, right? Because they're on this day-to-day -day what the libraries are doing because the gender neutral bathrooms are fine for many people, but it may not be fine for everybody. So it's just, True. what is that balance? And what, you know, what's the different, the, you know, one town may have a, you know, a older population and wouldn't want that as much. So let us do a little more research and we'll come back to the, right. to the next meeting with a little more information. That's, but one that's thing, a, yeah, go ahead. I, one thing I wanted to say, I have a, I have a hard stop at 11, at 10. We yep. have someone out who just got married and they're on their honeymoon and I'm the only one who can cover the meeting. <laughs> So I hope it just mean can stay with you, um, but I will have to stop at 10. No problem. You cut out when you need to. Okay, thank you. Um, 
So just, I just want to, you brought up a point before that, so kind of the old way of building was all the bathrooms were either male or female. Mm -hmm. And then we started this process of creating, you know, family bathrooms or everybody bathrooms, and they were a small percentage. So part of maybe what happens is that we just have almost all gender neutral bathrooms, but there might, instead we end up with a female bathroom or Mm -hmm. like, because the whole point is everybody has to feel safe and comfortable with where they have to go to the bathroom. Mm -hmm. So um, there's the making it, you know, trying to do the right thing to everybody. Again, it's a balance. So my last question is in doing all this adjusting, I'm just asking, it's not to, you know, does it cost more? Like bathrooms are expensive. I know that changing this around, is that pricey? I, I don't, I, we don't know that because we don't know if, if we're going to increase the count of fixtures. It's not crazy, Christine, right? It's just, <laughs> we have the bathrooms now and it's, if it's adding four more fixtures, that's not going to bust your budget. I think the, the more important thing is to get it right, right? For the town of Amherst, because every town is different. So yeah, we, we can work with you and work with, you know, our consultants and, and, and get us through this. Okay, it's new, new. I see, uh, George, your hands up. Um, I was just going to make the comment that, you know, I remember in the beginning that everybody was pretty much in agreement that we wanted to have gender neutral bathrooms. <laughs> but it's my thought that, say, if we finish the building, do gender neutral bathrooms, and there's a huge outcry, it's a lot easier to backtrack and create specific male, female specific bathrooms than try to turn mm-hmm. male, female specific bathrooms into gender neutral bathrooms. Correct. So if we went forward with all gender neutral bathrooms and had a freak out later on down the road, it'd be easier, it would be easier to accommodate those people. Mm-hmm. That's true. Good point. Um, all right, are there um, any other questions or hands or comments? Um, if not, I'm gonna roll into item seven, which is public comment. And Angela, I'll probably need your help with this. Uh, is there anyone in the um, attendees who have a question or would like to speak? Uh, put up your hand now and we'll hook you up. So there's seven people in the room, but it does not appear anyone is raising their hand. So um, we can, uh, I just want to double check that our next meeting is on the 13th at 9 a.m. And uh, since we still have Ellen here, is this time all right? Like we, we've been oh, rolling on this Friday, every other Friday at nine. This is all right with you and Craig? Yes, it works for me. And I, you know, typically I don't have to attend this other meeting, but I'm just covering. Okay. So I, and it, it works for you, Josephine. And, and I think it works for Tony because he was his plan right. was to join us today. And if it does become problematic as we roll on, you know, I mean, there's only three of of us, so we can probably, or four with Austin, we can, you know, adjust. So, okay, Okay. that will be the next meeting. So um, this is subcommittee. I'm just gonna say we're adjourned at uh, 9.54. So everyone have a great weekend. Thank you so much for um, coming and see ya soon. Have a good weekend. Take care. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye. (laughs)